Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the No Holds Bar. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out MMA History Podcast. My name is Joey Venti. With me is Mike Davis. He's the MMA detective. I'm the broken down old fireman, and we're going to break down another chapter in the book of MMA history. This episode's special to me because his career was special to me. I had a front row seat from his undocumented fights in high school gyms to his world championship belt. Our guest is a veteran of the UFC, the WEC, and the first ever King of the Cage featherweight champion of the world, my submission factory brother, Charlie Valencia. Charlie, how the hell are you doing? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me. So... There was a lot of that beginning that encompassed a career that might be forgotten by today's fans. I mean, truth be told, Pat Militich holds a seminar and he'll be lucky if he gets 30 people there, which is criminal. And I think in all of our opinions, but that 145 pound belt started with you. And it was before the UFC had it, before the WEC even existed. The only place to become a world champion, at least here outside of mm -hmm. Japan, uh, including Canada, was was king of the cage, and you wore that belt. So, Charlie, truly an honor to have you here, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. So, Joey, let's start at the beginning. Charlie, you don't seem like one of those guys that has a lot of street fights. Like, you're the guy that's always kind of leaning into, like, altercations. What gives you your start in mixed martial arts? Uh, wrestling. I mean, just just – competing uh and also at that time when i graduated high school i wrestled a little bit in college and didn't want to wrestle anymore to be honest uh, but things started falling into place in a sense where um after high school i didn't want to wrestle again and then they came up to me and they're like okay come come and wrestle just wrestle one tournament and then I'd go wrestle that tournament and I'd take first. And then I was drawn back in again to the competition life. And then after I wrestled at East Los Angeles Junior College for, for two years, I ended up saying the same thing. I don't want to wrestle anymore. And then I went to go visit a friend of mine at Fresno State. And then I was had classes by Monday at Fresno State. So then I was drawn back into it again. Um, Stuff like that. And then after my career was done with uh, with wrestling, I, I think just the next, next natural move was just to move into mixed martial arts because we were already doing that. Of course, Larry was my was my high school coach. Larry Landis yep. was my high school coach. So we kind of were already kind of like dipping into it a little bit without even knowing what we were doing. Uh, we wanted... Um, uh, we would get in with our song with our geese tops just like sambo at wrestling practice and it, it, it went through judo throws because larry thought that would help us with our with our wrestling so we would do judo throws in, in, in wrestling practice and then to cut weight we'd put our geese on with boxing gloves and we'd go wrestling and boxing at the same time so we, we'd always try to find a fun way to cut weight and that was one of the ways we'd do it so, in essence, Larry Landless, although the coach of a wrestling team, was trying to see who was going to be a fighter for his. I think so. Yeah. Well, Larry also gave me my first job uh, as a as a bouncer at a nightclub that he used to work at. So, if you guys want to go really far back, that's kind of like where it all started. I mean, I'm not a person who starts a fight, but I'm all, I'm always willing to kind of you know get into it because it was kind of fun. Uh, but I worked many years as a nightclub uh, bouncer, the smallest guy there. So, and Larry was my boss. Yeah, Larry told us to make sure that we talk about being the shortest bouncer at Black Angus. <laughs> that when, when you guys were throwing a drunk guy out of a club, they would try to pick a fight with the smallest guy, not knowing who you were. And it didn't go well. Yeah, it was fun. But of course, with, with the guys who are not trained and, and drunk, yeah. Uh, it's a lot easier <laughs> for sure a lot easier but Larry, Larry used to get a kick out of it and he used to uh, start some shit or something and then have 
me go outside and uh, and handle it. But he used to always get a kick out of it. <laughs> I mean, it's like you figure you're drunk, you're big. Okay, you're gonna send somebody outside. Mm-hmm. You know, guy, if your stature shows up, they got to be happy until they're you know counting stars. You know, asking yeah. what happened. What happened? <laughs> well, oh, back then. There's some stories I'm telling you. I don't even know if it's uh, if I'm legally uh, allowed to uh, <laughs> to say those. Back then, guys didn't know to check for cauliflower ear before starting a fight with the short guy. Yeah, but you know what though? I didn't have cauliflower when I was wrestling. I I started getting it when I uh, was uh, started getting into jujitsu a lot more. That's when I got cauliflower. It wasn't with the wrestling. Well, you wrestled, was it D, you wrestled Division One? am I correct? Yeah, I was at uh, Fresno State for a little bit, uh, right when uh, Jerry, it was Jerry Abbas, that was a teammate of mine, the, the Zinkins, which you guys know now are really big in, uh, in MMA with um, AKA, uh, you had Nikki Zinkin, Dwayne Zinkin, Harold Zinkin, they're like a big, big uh, real management. Guys. It was a management company as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yes. They were yeah. uh, the ones that got lured Sean Shirk away from Monty Cox. If you listen to our first Monty Cox interview, we addressed that. Yeah, it was, uh, they were real plugged with the UFC as well. Like they had a real good relationship until they got a champion. And then it just kind of went downhill. <laughs> yeah, they were uh, big, they're still wrestling, a lot big fat wrestling family um, up in the mid uh Central California area. Central California. Okay. Yeah. So they do like, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think they kind of own like the Save Mart and all these mini malls there and stuff. I, th- I think the, the story went where they, uh, their grandfather was the owner of uh, Universal Weights. Oh, wow. And yeah. So he ended up selling that to whoever for millions of dollars and just, they made their their money from that and they got okay. into real estate. So that's Good. the whole thing. But anyways, I was at Fresno State and um, my wife, which was my girlfriend at the time, uh, got pregnant. So I came back home and got a job. Really? Mm-hmm. But at Fresno State, I got my black belt and judo because I wasn't eligible to wrestle at the time. So I wanted to do something. So there was a judo team. So I decided to join the judo team and uh, I got my black belt there and I came back and, uh, and, you know, raised my family, started to raise my family. Would you say those upper body judo holds and throws elevated your, your grappling game? Um, not necessarily. I think my wrestling is the, what, what did it, you know, okay. um, I, I, I used to wrestle in, in, in at East LA junior college, we weren't a very big wrestling team, but the head coach there, his wife was Armenian. So I don't know what they were into, but they would get wrestlers from Armenia or Europe for that matter and try to get them citizenships, right? So they would bring them into the wrestling room, but these were not just ordinary wrestlers. They were silver medalists in the Olympics. They were world champions. They were, I mean, these guys were the cream of the crop coming from Europe, trying to get citizenship or get a job or whatever it may be. And our, the room was full of these European national champs. I mean, decorated wrestlers. So I would go in there and it was kind of funny because I would never, um, I wouldn't get a takedown all day. All day, I wouldn't get a takedown. I'd get my ass handed to me all day and would not understand. I mean, there was times that I would get my ass kicked so bad that I would go, I got to go, uh, I got to go to the restroom, literally go to the restroom, fucking cry my ass off, and then go back in and get my ass kicked some more. But then tournaments would come roll by. They weren't being, they weren't able to participate in the tournaments. And I was. So when I would go to tournaments, I would take first place and not get taken down once. But my room was the one that was, I didn't understand that back then. I thought I was on an even playing field with these guys. I didn't understand that at that point. And um, when I did, I look back at it now and I go, they're the ones who made me better. You know what I mean? I would say that the, in my personal opinion, the biggest tool for 
the United States, the average American, to understand the Muslim culture. There's been no better help than the sport of mixed martial arts. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Like, no, no book, no documentary, no TV mm-hmm. show. The sport of mixed martial arts has educated more people in the United States about their culture and their religion more than anything else that has kind of been put I agree. forth. I agree. And I was lucky, like, I was lucky to wrestle. I think wrestling is the best sport in the world. I mean, it is the best sport in the world. It's I, to me, it's always been a martial art. You know what I mean? To me, it's been a martial art. So, um, like, what what I have today, the way I think, the way I live my life, revolves around wrestling, martial arts. That's basically how it is with me, at least. And um, the things I have today is I, I, I owe it to wrestling. You know, the people I know, the relationships I have and the relationships I still keep today, you know, Joey's being a part of it, right? You know, him, he was there from day one. He saw a lot of stuff, he participated in a lot of crazy things. Yeah. Know? He's another, he's another guy that uh, I admire because I came from competing many, many years before he even started competing. So I already had a jump start on it and Joey not knowing anything and being green to it, jumped in right with me with, you know, with no fear and not knowing the consequences, you know what I mean? And I thought that was amazing. That, that really was inspiring. I took some beatings in the training room, but yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I kept coming back. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. we all did. We all did. Yeah, Joey, I'm assuming you knew exactly how many light fixtures were on that ceiling. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on my back. Yeah. <laughs> well, Charlie, your story is very unique in the sense that you started in the NHB era. It was yes. the, before the rules or when the rules were in place, there was loopholes. And you fought for the promotions that found the loopholes, no matter how crazy they were. You always... Set you know, put your foot forward, knowing that there was no insurance available if anything bad took place. Yes, um, <laughs> you know what? Again, it was just for me. It was a part of just the competition. You know, I wanted to test myself. I wanted to see how far I could take it. Uh, I, I I couldn't do anything else at the time. I thought this is what I put a lot of years of my life into already. It just seemed it was the right thing to transition to, you know what I mean? I mean, I was good at something and whether I I quit now and kind of like wasted all those years I I trained for or try to start a new path here and see where it took me. And that's basically how I looked at it. I wanted to, I wanted to take it as far as I could take it without looking back when I'm 40, 50 years old saying, you know what? I should have done it or I, sh- you know what I mean? That I didn't want that. I didn't want that. Um, how would you describe your relationship with Larry Landless? Oh, it's, it's great. It's great. We had, I mean, we're family, you know, and family has a, you know, a, 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 we, we, we could argue and fight, but at the end of the day, we're family. And, and I love that man. He's given me a lot without him. Um, I wouldn't have done the things I would have done. There, there was a, um, I, I, I'm not going to say rumor. There, there was a couple people that had told me that at the high school that he was coaching at, that he would do MMA practices using their mats. And the people that would come in would have to like pretend like that they knew where they were walking to. And if somebody were to come in and monitor you guys, you guys would have to change it up to, to doing wrestling and no more fighting so he wouldn't get in trouble. Is, is there truth to that? Yeah, there is. He's such an originator in that sense. But see, you got to to know Larry. Larry has always had a very big imagination. You know, he's always pushed the boundaries in the sense, like, let's try something different. Um, Let's, uh, he's always willing. He's a, he's a, he's a fan. And he's also of of just grappling period in the martial arts. He's always been Taekwondo, Kung Kung Fu, whatever it may be. He was always trying to uh, implement stuff like that. So to me, he was an originator. There's a lot of people that thank, should thank him for getting their start in this uh, MMA thing, you know, that nobody thought would blow up to, to what it is today. But um, yeah, he's a, he's, he's a pioneer. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, your first fight on record, which obviously is not your first fight, 
was mm-hmm. March 11, 2000, Cobra Fighting Federation against Octavio Morales. Had you fought, I mean, you fought prior to this, correct? Yeah, to be, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly how many times, but um, we did Pancrase. I mean, I think Joey did a couple Pancrase, if I remember. I did. I did. Uh, we did Pancrase. We did um, fights in small gyms. Uh, I fought a bouncer at, from a local nightclub one time. That was good. Uh, I was only weighing around. I, I wrestled at, in college at 118 pounds. So when I got out of college, I didn't, when I started fighting, I wasn't weighing more than 124, 25. And uh, guys were, I was fighting up to 170 at that time. But again, <laughs> but again, at, at, at this point, I had an upper hand on a lot of people because of just my grappling ability, you know? Uh, a lot of people were barely getting, trying to figure out watching the first UFC, you know, they were figuring it out on what to do and striker versus grappler and all this stuff. But um, I, I feel like with the grappling, I had an upper hand on it and uh, it, it just made it a little easier for me. But well, cool. I fought Go that ahead. fight. I, I fought that fight and I can recall a few pancreation fights. I don't know who they were. We, uh, Larry's, what Larry used to do was just, show, uh, do you want to fight tomorrow? And, then, and I would come home from work because I've always had a full-time job supporting my family. I'd come home on a Friday night. I want to sit down, watch some TV, uh, have a few beers, right? Just kick it. And Larry would call and say, hey, man, do you want to fight tomorrow? And I'm like, nah, don't want to fight. Yeah, I'm cool, you know. But then after a six-pack of beer, then I'm like, call back. I'll do it, you know. <laughs> Which and, is and, a very – wait, that's a very important step in the decision-making process. Absolutely. I might <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So then the next morning, I would go without a mouthpiece. I'd go buy a mouthpiece at Big Five or something and then – show up and fight but you show up they'll line you up and basically kind of try to choose similar sizes and match them up but i was always i was always the smallest guy there so i would get some guys who are big um then another one that i think so, so wait, wait, wait let, let's not let that slide by it was way in by sight yes That's true. No, yeah, no scale no no scale, scale. no 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 <laughs> No, very important. Very it, important. It was an honor system. <laughs> it yeah. was, yeah. and it was very, <laughs> and there was no honor in the system. I'll tell you no. that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but uh, so, I, I fought, I fought also uh, Victor Hunsaker. I think he was a neutral grounds champ at the time, and he was about 170 pounds, maybe. And uh, one of Larry's, in one of Larry's show, and I think Herb, that was one of Herb's first, Herb Dean's first uh, refing assignments. Uh, he ended up, the rules were at that time was if you didn't get knocked out, if you didn't get submitted. It's a draw. It's a draw. Yeah. So that was kind of common across the entire country. Yeah. But let, let, let's stick with the Cobra Fighting Federation. So Cobra Fighting Federation has kind of got one of those legendary type feels. Joey, would you mind opening up a little bit about what you know about that event? This card in particular was the craziest MMA show I've ever been to. The, <laughs> the main event that's not listed on SureDog was an intergender championship with a 240-pound lady versus a visibly drunk man. Um, at, at one point, a couple of guys in the crowd get in a fight, and Mark Hall jumps in the ring and says, we're going to get these guys contracts and mouthpieces. They're going to fight next, and they put them in the ring. Now, was it staged ahead of time? Maybe, but... That was the feel. My best friend, Jimmy, and I, shout out Jimmy, we learned a valuable lesson on this night because we learned that you do not take your girlfriends to an MMA show at a casino if they're USC sorority girls. Because these girls looked at us like we were the craziest people ever. Like, what is this shit you're into? You know, and how did I, ta- how did I let you bring me to this? Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was an educational experience just being, just being in the show. And we had about four guys on Submission Factory on that card. So, so Charlie, this is the type of show where you have fought with wrestling shoes on, you fought barefoot, belt buckles and cowboy boots often were the uh, attire of the people fighting at the Cobra Fighting Federation. (laughs) 
Yeah, it was a, it was pretty, uh, it was, it was fun. I got to admit it. I think uh, those days were a lot, a lot more fun because it was so simple. You know what I mean? It, 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 it was just two guys getting in there and fighting. Now it's, a, it, it, as, as it got sanctioned and it got, it's gotten a lot more complicated. Um, no, no. Uh, uh, Sometimes it's point fighting, I think is what you're trying to describe. Well, no, it just, I just like the fact that it's you and me and that's it. And there's no doctor checking. Yeah, then. there's no, yeah. It, it just was a lot easier. You show up and you fight and you go home, you know. Uh, that particular show I fought, uh, I remember showing up. I mean, drove way in the hell out. I think it was Calu- Was it Calusa C- Casino, if I remember? I, so. I remember. Um, way out in the middle of nowhere. So when you show up, I had to work on Monday. This is a Saturday. So what I always try to do is, and I started to uh, uh, manipulate the gloves. I had gloves on. Everybody else did it. It was bare, bare knuckle. But I had to go to work on Monday, so I had to protect my hands. So what I used to do is buy those weightlifting, I don't know. Harbingers, the harbinger those, gloves. Those, and then I would cut the little bar out that they had in the palm, and I'd open it. I'd basically just make my own gloves and, uh, and fought like that with, with shoes and gloves because I had to protect myself. But um, I remember right before then, uh, Chuck Liddell came up to me, and I guess Chuck was – kind of uh you know in the wrestling community kind of everybody kind of knows a little bit about each other Sweet. standout he, junior college wrestler chuck liddell yes and he came up to me he's like oh, you're gonna kick some ass i hope you do good you know this year i didn't know who, who he was at the time i really didn't know who he was but um i remember that conversation with we had about doing being in that show and then him later on doing so well in his career so it was kind of nice to see but uh, is this Mohawk Chuck Liddell at this time? Yes, he had so just he... started doing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tattoo on the head, Chuck Liddell, or no? Um, I don't quite remember that though. But I was so focused into you know my fight that I was yeah. just kind of like, yeah, yeah, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> and uh, I it's remember jumping in the later. ring. Yeah. <laughs> I remember ju- jumping in the ring and cigarette smell, smoke, cigars. I mean, you're, you're trying to fight, you're trying to fight and this, it's just, it's a casino environment and people smoking big old cigars, right? Ringside and everything. And I knew I had a fight. And I, I think the, the one thing I learned the most out of that fight was checking lay kicks. And I'm glad that I learned from my, that first fight on how to check leg kicks because I couldn't walk for two weeks after that. I couldn't. I I, he, I, I got I didn't check any leg kicks, so my leg was just beat up so bad that I, I couldn't walk for two weeks. And I remember after the second week, I was trying to bend my knee and I could hear and feel the fibers tearing from my muscles, you know? Mm. And I had to like actually get it back to bend again. But ever since that fight, Oh man, I dedicated hours to checking and that would got me better at checking kits, you know? That's excellent. So Octavio Morales, you win by decision. Um, Octavio went to train at Millennia after this. Was it during this fight or after? Do you recall? After we ended up That's training together after. Yeah. He, his, his, uh, uh, his career went a different path and I, I don't know, personal issues and stuff like that, but, uh, he was a good guy. I had no, yeah. no no problem with him, and we trained together afterwards. I thought he was a lot more talented. You know, you could have. I think he could have done something. In uh, your Gladiator Challenge, which is your next fight, it's February eighteenth of two thousand one. I'm sure you've got yeah. some smokers in between there. Mm-hmm. Eddie Bravo described your fight with David Vasquez or Velasquez as potentially fight of the year. Oh wow, Eddie did. Yes, he did. Well, that's that's nice for him to say that. Uh, the way I got into the Gladiator Challenge was because of Eddie, and we we did a tournament. And again, we'll go. We'll probably have to circle back to this, but I did not like going to submission tournaments. I wasn't a big like jujitsu tournaments, jujitsu tournaments, submission tournaments. So there was the Pan Americans that were going to 
come by, right? It was that weekend, I believe. And my cousin, Joe Camacho, was a jujitsu guy. We could circle back to that because that's how he started. I got him into MMA, but he liked jujitsu. I'm more of a wrestling-based kind of guy. And Wait, I did let not- me interject. Wait, let me interject. At this point, the jujitsu community was altering their rules against wrestlers. So the yes, wrestling sir. community, th- there was... You got two cousins. You got the jujitsu cousin. You got the wrestler cousins. You guys are brothers. You're blood brothers, but you like to fight each other. And mm-hmm. when the jujitsu community at this time started altering the rules, the wrestling community took great offense to it. Well, yeah, I I did, and I I literally stopped going. I didn't I did not want to go to any uh, submission tournament, jujitsu tournament, uh, uh, and pay 70, 80 bucks and not be guaranteed a damn match. I go, I go uh, on the weekend, go to a wrestling tournament, pay 10 bucks and wrestle in all, in all styles. So to me, what, what, where was my, my money best maxed Wait, out? You know? Let me interject one more time. And I apologize, Charlie. You, mm-hmm. We have a 70-30 flow. You speak 70%. We speak 30%. But these jiu-jitsu tournaments at this time would charge you $70, $80. And if you didn't have anybody in your division, which – you're a lighter guy, pretty difficult. They yep. would say, no, we'll just give you a medal. We're keeping your money. Yep. Like, or there, wasn't, there wasn't good business practice initially no. on the jiu-jitsu side. Things have changed since then. But at this time, that, that that's just reality. Go ahead. I apologize. Yeah, no, no. You're absolutely right. It, I, I, I wouldn't even get anything, not even a medal. It, it, if I were to go pay 70 bucks and nobody was at my weight class. It was, sorry, nobody was here, but they kept my money, you know what I mean? So I got a little upset about that, and I said, I'm never going to any jiu-jitsu tournaments anymore. But my cousin, who was all <laughs> into it, was like, come on, Charlie, let's go. Go, like, I'll pick you up, I'll pay for you, this year. And me reluctantly would go, damn it, my wife would go, just go, you know, he wants you to go, just go. All right, we'll go. Well. There was a Pan Americans at this time. This is how I got into um, the Gladiator Challenge. I ended up, uh, I went up winning a few matches. And then for the finals, I had Eddie Bravo. And uh, Wait, that's, so Eddie Bravo, from what I gather, it's May 20th, 2001, Grappling Games Jiu Jitsu. Eddie Bravo and yourself meet in the finals. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's and, amazing. Uh, at, you're, you, you, got, you, you did some homework. That's good. Yes. Right? I don't, I honestly, I don't even think people even know about this. So, um, I, I, I saw this match. It, you it, was, saw, pretty, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty dramatic. The jujitsu community was thinking the wrestler that's been beating us. Well, now he's got Eddie and he's going to defend the honor of jujitsu. It was a great match. Go ahead. Jay. Yeah, it was good. It, it was very, it was a good match. Um, his jujitsu was kind of stifling me a little bit. Um, I just somehow it went into overtime. And in overtime, I took him down and I got points on it to take down. But the crazy part about that is I did not want to be there so badly because I didn't want to, didn't like, I didn't like doing this. That as soon as I got that takedown, I got my stuff and left. I went home. And wait, wait. So this is kind of like DJ Penn knocking Kaluno out and just leaving the cage. That's yeah, what you I did essentially. <laughs> yeah. Because you know what? I thought that. Knowing the jiu-jitsu community at that time, I thought they were going to reverse it and they were going to have to go back at it again. That's what I thought. So I didn't want to give them a chance. I just said, you know what? You guys, my hand was raised. I'm gone. I'm out of here. So I left home. Was there arguing afterward in regards to the decision? I, I it, Not on my part. Not on my part. I so I just left. And, uh, well, well, here, did you have a conversation with Eddie before or after this about that fight? About that fight? Never, never, never. It was weird because I think, I don't know, uh, in, in retrospect, I think I was a competitive person. He was a competitive person. I think now that I'm beyond all that stuff, I think it'd be nice for us to have a conversation about it. Um, and I think, I think he's way over it too. You know what I mean? We're all past past that and uh uh 
No, we have never really talked about it. Never. Did you did you get your picture taken on the podium? No. Oh my God, you really just left. Yeah, I left the trophy and everything. I didn't want nothing to do with it. Yeah. Mm hmm. You know, yeah. I, I, okay, that speaks volumes of how contentious the wrestler jujitsu relationship was at that time. Mm -hmm. You you didn't care about the well, you're you're not that guy. You don't care. No, not even your hand about raised. That's yeah. it. I, I, to be honest, I didn't know who Eddie was. I didn't know who Eddie was. I was so out of touch of the jujitsu. I mean, I would do some tournaments and stuff, and I heard about certain things. I just didn't like the way the jujitsu community at that time did business. And I did not want to be a part of it. I didn't want to offer my hard work money, you know, work money for it. So as soon as I, I, I won, I left. And that was just my idea. Like I said that was my mentality at that time. You know what I mean? I didn't want nothing to do with it. And my cousin Joe was all, all about it, you know? You know, um, I remember having conversations with people, wrestlers in particular, mm -hmm. and they would say, well, the reason I don't like going to jiu-jitsu tournaments is because you're there all day. Like, you get there at 7, 8 a.m., you might not get your match till 4 in the afternoon, and there's no rhyme or reason. And it's mm -hmm. not organized, but if I pay 10 and it's 80 bucks, 70, but if I go to a wrestling tournament and pay 10, it's on point. Like by, by, by two or three o'clock we're out and there's five or 600 wrestlers there. Yeah. And I, I, I remember always just being kind of mind boggled. Like, well, the jujitsu community needs to steal the people working the wrestling tournaments and just kind of figure out what's, what works or follow them around. And I think smooth comp and, you know, various other organizations really helped iron things out to where jujitsu tournaments yeah. now are they're absolutely fantastic yeah they, they are i watch I, I watch them online and stuff now i'm a fan i mean don't get me wrong i might I, you know I'm, I'm talking all this negativity but i am a, a fan of grappling arts period you of course I, I love jujitsu to me jujitsu is a superior martial art it definitely is the more i trained into in it it, 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 the more it, my wrestling benefited and vice versa, you know? So uh, I, I love jujitsu. Jujitsu to me is, I mean, even as a wrestler, I'm going to say it. If you put a wrestler and a jujitsu guy together, jujitsu guy is going to win. It's just for me though, I was hard headed at that time and I really was stubborn. And uh, um, it took me a long time to kind of, you know, come to grips with it. But I also, it took me a long time to learn jujitsu, you know, and, and, and appreciate it because in wrestling, you know, you, you hit a double leg, you hit a single leg. Sometimes it's not smooth. You got to power through it. You got to force your way through it. You got to drive your feet. You got to go. The jujitsu is a lot more finesse. It's a lot more setups. It's a lot more methodical in a sense, you know, it's so different math. Like, it's different math. Yeah, it's just different math. So yeah. I, as soon as I started to get that part of jujitsu, then I'd rather do jujitsu than wrestle. It's you know, geometry and algebra. They're both mm -hmm. math. They're just different kinds of math. I love jujitsu. Jujitsu is so much yeah. more fun. You know, it's easier on the body. It's it's just fun. You know, and I can't say that with wrestling. Wrestling is not hard. fun. No, no it's hard. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's you enjoy wrestling for it not being fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that's why wrestlers do so well because of that i think because wrestling is wrestling sucks man the wrestling lifestyle sucks it really does you got to cut weight you got to perform you know have it. it's it's so much draining on the body but it makes you mentally stronger i think it's possibly the most mentally tough sport mm -hmm. in the world and like you got whooped by a guy yeah by tech or pinned by a guy all right well next time i'm only going to get tech all right, next time I'm only going to give up a few points. And mm -hmm. so you start scoring points. And, you know, wrestling, that's what it is. You're going to see a guy five, six times in a season that yep. you've had problems with, and you've got to push through that. And you got to make those adjustments. And then also uh, in wrestling, I think I've, I've, bitten, I've been beaten up probably just as much in a wrestling match than I have in, in the fight. So what, depending on what kind of person you're wrestling, and some of those Midwestern guys coming in and they're just – snapping the shit out of you, you know, throwing their forehead in your face. They're coming at you hard. No, not much technique, but yet they're just fierce. They're just on you. 
They don't let you breathe. Man, you, there's days I'll, I'll wake up on Sunday after a tournament and I can't move. You know, it's, just, it's really, yeah, that's how it is. Yeah. So Mark Schultz in our Mark Schultz interview, he said, uh, if you want to learn jujitsu, the best way as a wrestler is to open up the rule book and look at illegal moves. They've even got little pencil drawings on how to do jujitsu there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of where, where, where wrestling stops, jujitsu continues. Yeah. Know? And it's and, fantastic. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I love, like I said, I love it. I, I, I try to get as much knowledge of it as possible. I admire all these, like, uh, these tournaments now that I see that. The way they blend the wrestling and the jiu-jitsu in is so, it's it's bitching, it's bitching. It's I, I, I can't. It's amazing now what 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 these guys could do now. It's like me watching skateboarding now. You know, like when I was a kid, I used to skateboard all the time doing ollie, and if you ollie, man, that was a big thing. Now these guys are doing some crazy ass freaking moves on a skateboard. Same thing. They're just the 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 way it's developed, the way it's just gotten so much more advanced. So in our Dan Henderson interview, he said he was finally glad to leave wrestling because he could learn something new. And it, it, it almost revives the burnt out wrestler. Yeah, it does. It does. Because it, that's, I could speak from that from a personal perspective. You're like I said, I was done wrestling. I really was. And um, if it wasn't for jujitsu, mixed martial arts, uh, it opened up another door for me and, and it's something I've already had done for so many years I said it just seemed like a natural transition it's yeah. what I was supposed to do you know cousins that like to fight each other that's wrestling oh, yeah. jiu-jitsu. that's what it yeah. is so I'm assuming you were a pretty big ticket seller because right off the bat you had some decent sponsors are you in.com was one of the, yeah. the people taking care of you yeah they they, they were uh, uh, the way I got a I, I got a hold I used to work for uh a beer company and one of the one of the employees there hooked me up with that and that's kind of crazy if you think about it now that was way before like myspace and all that other stuff i just wonder why they didn't you know do as well but it was basically the same idea that's what it was is facebook uh myspace that was the whole without thing. yeah they just didn't have the government funding yeah, to Probably, start. yeah, right. Yeah. Or the database. Yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. So that, it was the same it's thing. different podcast. It's a different yeah, podcast. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, on September 29, 2001, uh, Bobby Gamboa is on a mm -hmm. team punishment and um, the Cobra fighting champion is your opponent and it's, you're fighting tough guys. Nobody's in your weight class up until this point. And Gamboa was was a tough opponent at 55 to 70, wherever he was. And mm -hmm. you're coming in at 100, under 135 pounds. Yeah, I was still a, a, I was still uh, under 130 at that time, I believe. That's um, nuts. And uh, so I would never have to cut weight. I would, it was not an issue. Weight was never an issue with me. Um, that particular, the first time I fought Bobby, uh, I don't know. I think I saw, I, I, I think I saw somebody slam. I think it was Tito slam uh, Zinoviev, I think his name was, and knocked him out with the double leg, I think it was. Frank Shamrock. I think it was Frank, Frank Shamrock. Shamrock. That yeah. one. That's the one. And um, wait, wait, real, real side note. We just talked about RUN.com. Mm -hmm. Igor Zinoviev, Jeffrey Epstein, personal bodyguard. No way. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. Damn. Yeah. Go ahead. Wow. I, I mean, you're, you're making me put my tinfoil hat on, but continue, Charlie. I apologize. All right. Um, <laughs> so I know he wanted to, he wanted to, you know, strike with me, and uh, I was start barely working on my Muay Thai at the time. And uh, oh wait, wait, I'll give you a bit. Let, let's if you want to go back, let's just go back to a, a previous one, okay? Well, this, this is, is the a, first one. This, okay, yeah. Well, that was, no, this is Bobby, but let's go back to Dave Velasquez, right? Okay. It, this is a funny story. Like, literally, a month prior to this, I had a, a, a kickboxing coach named Attila, right? And he basically started to work with 
one, two, kick, jab, punch, jab, cross, kick. Very simple, right? So we got that combination down. And he's telling me throughout training camp, I want you to stand up, throw the one, two, throw your kick, circle back, just basically give me basic striking skills here. So we're practice, practicing this shit because we're supposed to implement this stuff, right, <laughs> in, in the fight. So backstage before that fight, um, the doctor comes in. Well, let's just, just another, we, we, I could go all over the place with this. But first, he goes and spies on Dave Velasquez. So he goes around the corner and he watches Wait, who, Dave. Who's he? Who's he? My Your coach. coach. I tell yeah. you. He, he, he goes and spies on him, right? And he realizes that he's hitting mitts like, I mean, this guy's fast. He's quick with his kicks and everything. So this whole time he's telling me, stand up with this guy. He circles back and I could see it on his face. And he looks at me with Charlie, take him down. <laughs> Lots and of confidence. Him, Lots of confidence look, in you. Yeah. And I look at, and I look at him like, I go, what the fuck have we been working on? I'm like, Really take it goes no, he goes take him down. I think you should take him down. <laughs> and I'm like, son of a bitch. I'm like, I'm gonna stand up with this guy. I don't care, you know, stubborn already. But this one, that same fight prior to that, we get that medical check, right? Well, they end up finding I have a heart murmur, right? So this is how business was done at uh, Gladiator Challenge at the time, or should I even say that or? <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're right. Okay. No, we've got some okay. stories. They're, they're still right. kind of doing that same stuff, truth be told. Well, the guy, the doctor comes in and says, Hey, um, you can't fight. You have a heart murmur. And I'm like, I don't have a heart murmur. I just, just first. So he checks me again and he goes, Yeah, I could clearly hear it. He says, And I'm thinking, Damn it. I trained, I drove all the way over here. To not make any type of money, which is nothing really. It just it was like I think it was like yes. five hundred bucks, two fifty or something like that. And uh, he goes, "Do you want to fight?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I want to fight." So then they go, they leave, and they type up this contract, and they bring it to me to sign, was stating, "If I die, right, <laughs> I'm not lying." <laughs> and my wife is watching me sign this shit, and she's crying, right? And I'm like, it's don't worry about it. I'm I'll be okay. I'll be okay. And I'm signing, just give it to me. I'll sign it, right? But basically, the, the contract stated that if anything happened and I died, that I wouldn't hold them responsible, liable. And uh, well, I, I'm saying, sure their insurance policy would really cover that as well. <laughs> yeah, which was hilarious. I mean, I I mean I, I I had there was no way I wasn't gonna fight, you know what I mean? But right. that was that's part of that one. But uh, we'll get back to the Bobby Gamboa one. That was, that. that's, uh, I, I finished him in like 37 or 47 seconds, I think, that first fight. And so you, you hit him with a big slam. Mm -hmm. And he gets top position? You, yeah. You okay. I, do, I do recall that. I slammed him because I didn't know exactly what was going on at the time. Um, when I took him down, I slammed him. I got on top of him and I was working jujitsu again. See, this is, I'm trying to work the stuff into the fights that I was working on. So he rolls me over, he gets top position. I put him in my guard and me, I'm thinking in my head, I'm going to start working some submissions that I've been working on in practice and stuff. And as I have an overhook on, I think I had, I think it was overhooked on his right side because He's right-handed, so I'm overhooked on his right side. And I hear him kind of grow, you know, like, like a, he was in pain. So I'm trying to figure it out. So I'm hitting him in his head. And I, once I hit him in his shoulder, I realized he didn't like that. And I knew his kind of shoulder was out at that point. So I just punched him in the shoulder until he tapped. Mm. That was he, the first fight. You know, he, Gamboa, to his credit, he knew his shoulder was out. He was mm -hmm. in excruciating pain. He just refused to tap. He was just hoping it would change. Like, 
Gimbo at the time is 14, three and one. So he's got a lot of experience and he's mm-hmm. not used to, when you got 14 wins and only three losses in, in one draw, which means, you know, that probably it could have been a win. You're, you don't want to lose. And yeah. for him to deal with that type of pain was, it spoke volumes of his character. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, he didn't want to give up. That's why I had to punch him in the shoulder. You know, uh, I, I, he, he's a tough, he's a tough guy. He really is. He's a, he's a good yeah. fighter. Um, he had rampage in his corner. Yeah, yeah. It's back in the days. This is good. The good old days. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, rampage yeah. was 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 wearing the chain. You know, this is 2001. This is pre pride for rampage, I believe. And yes, it, it was. I mean, he was he was all marketed out at that point. Like he he, he would show up in. to the shows with gloves on. That's how Rampage used to show up. And, mm-hmm. I, and I would ask him, I'm like, hey, dude, are you fighting tonight? He goes, no. And I'm thinking, what, why the hell do you have gloves on then for? You know, I mean, he just walk around with gloves on and his chain and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Unique, unique character there. <laughs> yeah. It's like when we were little before MMA existed, the guys walking around with like their gi outfits. Like, man, I'm at a, I'm at a Chicago White Sox game and I see a guy, you know, in his karate <laughs> uniform. Like, what, what are we doing here, man? You know, yeah. What are we doing? <laughs> yeah. So after Gamboa, you get a rematch with David Velasquez. Now, Velasquez, at this point, it's a pretty emotional fight to watch from my standpoint because Gam- uh, Velasquez, at this point, said, man, I had the flu right around the time in our first fight. I almost won. And, like, if you look at what he did, he went all in. He made incredible sacrifices with training. He went and trade with BJ Penn, Frank Shamrock, Bobby Southworth over at AKA. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's the guy that looked at the problem in front of him, made incredible sacrifices, and then what happens? Oh, um, well, again, like I was working a lot of my submissions at the time and, and starting to believe in them a little more and more. And... I think I started to become a little bit of a smarter type fighter, you know, instead of having to stand up and take damage or, or, or leveled I, I up. I, yeah. So I, so I decided to submit the guy, you know what I mean? And, and I think he didn't think that I was going to do that, you know? So, it, it, I mean, I just, I just wanted to be a little smarter. It was hard for me throughout my career, to be honest, to really put in 110% into my training because I did hold a full-time job down. So the only, and a family. So I only had time to get home from work, literally shower, go to the gym, work out for two, three hours and come back home and do it all over again. So I only had maybe a time to work out once, uh, once a day, you know, at the most. And if I was really tired, you know, I probably wouldn't even go to practice. And, And so I had to start looking at different avenues on how to win without going into the third round or second round. So, so Velasquez, like when you watch that hand raising ceremony, you see somebody just kind of understanding reality that sometimes you're only given so many tools and mm-hmm. every once in a while you come across somebody that's got a bigger, better set. And mm-hmm. it's like, honestly, from my point of view, never having spoken to the guy, very emotional watching him kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure he was, he was a UFC vet, you know, uh, fought Jens Pulver, you know, I'm sure he wanted to get back there, you know? Yeah. But that's just the fight game, man. It's just, it, it, it happens. You, you do it to someone and then eventually it happens to you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Ooh, mm-hmm. Dude, the fight game tells you when you're done. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, it does. It, it ain't the opposite. That's for sure. Um, one of your fa- my favorite fights to watch that, that you're in is um, your Greg Mayer fight, King of the Cage, September 5th, 2003. He's with Team Mash. He's a Division One wrestler. He's mm-hmm. 2-0, and but he's got wins over Jamal Perkins and Bao Quash. So mm-hmm. it's, he's got two, whatever was established in the mixed martial art world in terms of pecking order, this guy just kicked that door down saying, no, 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 that number one spot's mine. Yeah, he was tough. I mean, he was a big guy. Again, I, I I still didn't, I wasn't cutting weight. We were still like at 145, one, I think it was like 145. Um, he had just, I think he knocked out uh, Jamal Perkins, I think the fight prior 
to that. So again, uh, I didn't, I'm trying to look at different avenues. I'm working on my jujitsu. So I'm starting to get more confident and I just start and knowing him having shoes on wrestling shoes on, I think I could probably get a heel hook. That's, that was my, my thought process going in. If I could get a takedown, get on top, drop for a heel hook or something. And I could utilize those uh, wrestling shoes to, to, you know, to grip on. And um, that's basically what happened. I mean, uh, that, I, so if you look at it, like with the discerning eye today, you hit a guillotine in the first round and I'm watching and mm -hmm. I'm saying to myself, he's going to burn his arms out. Like that lactic acid's coming. Yeah. And you, and when I say that in my head, you probably went another 45 seconds to a minute after that. So for sure your arms were gone. Mm -hmm. Then he transitioned to a triangle and you're in a triangle and I'm like, he's burning his legs out. You almost had to be picked up off the mat to get to your corner in the second round. We mentioned a name earlier, Joe Camacho, somebody very dear to you. Mm -hmm. That pep talk in between that first and second round, is something you should probably familiarize yourself with again. It's, it's pretty intense. Yeah, man. Uh, I'll, fortunate to have him in my corner, you know, he believed in me so much, uh, probably more than probably that I did, you know, at times. So it, it was nice to have him in my corner. And uh, I don't remember, to be honest, that much on how, I, I mean, like I said, my training wasn't the great greatest at the time, um, but I loved fighting. So even if I didn't train very hard for a fight, I, I, I still would show up, you know, and, and that's just, kind of person I am but uh uh that's kind of like my downfall in my career was that my conditioning because of the time the lack of time I was able to to, to put into until probably later on probably the tail end of my career that when I decided to kind of go all in and 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 start and start to train harder and make it a, a career when I was able to make somewhat decent money you know what I mean how would you let's talk about Joe Camacho. Uh, he comes up occasionally in our podcast and we like to give him, you know, the credit he deserves, you know, somebody mm -hmm. that you know, might not have the name recognition as some of the other California guys, but his contributions to the early years of mixed martial arts in California is, is something that I, I think deserves a rec some recognition. Oh, for sure, man. This guy, his mentality was just amazing on marketing like for instance if he was a, if, if he was alive today he would be such a great manager he would be such a great uh he just he just he knows how to market himself he knew how to uh social media even before that was going on and um such a competitor that's one thing that i that that i could advise this guy he would fight literally a drop of a dime. I mean, just because he loved to fight too. He loved to fight. He loved to be out there. He, he didn't care. Losing was not anything big in his, in his mind. See, for me, me losing probably devastate me for about a few days, you know what I mean? Or a few weeks. I, I, I had to learn to lose and quickly get over it, right? So I could improve, get back in the room, and, and make adjustments. Joe was the other way around. Joe would freaking fight somebody and lose. And then the next day he's back in the room trying to get better. So to me, that was, was awesome to see. And it took me a long time to learn. And he, he already had it down. He knew the business. This, he, I took it personally. I took it uh, like if I lost, I, I wouldn't probably be in the room. It, it just, it, it'll hurt me really bad. And it took me a long time to develop, under, to understand that this is just a business, you know, this is a business and I, I needed to treat it as such. So I, I, I he, he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot. He de definitely did. Joey, what about your, you, what was your experience with Joe Camacho? He was a great friend. I, um, 
-hmm. I met him actually the night of the Cobra Classic. That's another uh, <laughs> reason that night was important. We, I had always heard that Charlie had this cousin or his wife had a cousin that did jujitsu, but I met him on the night of the Cobra Classic and uh, he was a really motivating guy. Um, he'd get you to, he'd drag you to the tournaments and if you lost in your weight division, he wouldn't let you get back in your car. He would make you sign up for the open weight division. That's the, that's the things I remember from him. And uh, yeah, he was, he was a great friend and a terrible loss that he, he died as early as he did. Well, I, I kind of like looking at the merit of somebody's character by the things that they don't tell you about that you find out afterward. Um, he volunteered at the Man E. Moreno Foundation for at-risk kids. And he, there, there's people that I've never met Joe. I've never had a conversation with him but I've done like a deep rabbit hole going into like his life. There were several people that regularly dealt with him that said they had no idea that he was constantly and, and very important to that organization and what it is that they did. Like, oh, yeah. it's like, is it really a charitable act when you have to tell everybody about it? Probably not. No, he never, but did that's that, how man. he was. That's the kind of guy he was. Um, he would just show up to my house and just hang out there. And after doing some charity work, and I knew all about it, you know. But again, I was working a full time job, and he was, was doing his own to thing. Drag you with him? Yeah, yeah. That's basically that's all he tried to do. And, and again, there's a lot of things that you know, when somebody passes away like that. I'm uh, like Joe with me. I had a lot of regret. Um. I think I could have been a better cousin. I think I could have been uh, a, a, a better everything to him because when he, when he passed away, uh, I think it was a great loss to the family, oh, yeah. to my wife, because he, he loved my wife. They, were, they grew up together in the same house. and um, But the way Joe got into it was because of me and I he, I would go to the Larry used to open up the boys club at um at, uh, a, it was a junior high and it was just a room and we had shitty ass mats uh wrestling mats that were so shitty that like the particles will fall off of it and get in your eye or get in your mouth or something you know so but but Larry would open up the room and that's the, that's the thing that's so cool cuz but we needed we needed places like that you know we needed places like that to go wrestle to just have open doors and uh joe was a karate guy taekwondo and him and i when me and his cousin started dating he knew i was a wrestler and he would always talk about his taekwondo and this and the other and i'm like yeah yeah whatever dude you know and and it got to a point where he was like let's go work out you know i'll show you so I'm like, all right, let's go, you know? So we took him over there, and I remember putting a good whipping on him, right? And he got so upset. He got so upset that he went. I At the time, I lived in East L.A., and he was always over my house, but he lived in Ontario. And uh, he would always be at my house. My wife had to buy certain jelly for his peanut butter jelly sandwiches. He would shoot. He would always be at the house, and I would tell my wife, "You know what? And I'm working all day. This guy, I come, I come, and he's on my couch eating my food. You know, like this is the stuff that would go through my head at the time. And uh, I'm like, if he stay, if he stays here longer than two weeks, I'll tell my wife, then he at least better take the trash out. He better cut the lawn. He better start <laughs> doing something. You know. <laughs> so he would have, so he would leave, but he would leave back to Ontario. Well, little did I know that he, he, he ended up uh, signing up for a jiu-jitsu uh, class. And that's how he started into it. And he was on a mission to kick my butt. That's basically <laughs> how it was. That's awesome. So every few, every few months, every few months, he would come over and he would stay at my house and he'd be like, hey man, um, you wanna go work out, you know? And I'm like, what the hell is this guy doing? You know, why does he wanna work out with me? I just didn't, didn't quite put, <laughs> Put it, put, you know, the, why he would want to constantly want to work out with me. All right, fine, fine, let's go. So then I'd put another whipping on him again. Then I wouldn't see him for another two, three months. He'd come back again and say, 
Do you want to go work out? Like he was constantly testing himself with me, constantly testing himself. You know, I didn't know that at the time, but it was awesome. I'm glad that that if it wasn't for me doing that, it, he would have never have, have got into mixed martial arts. He wouldn't have never done those things. And I'm, I, I was just happy to 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 be a part of it because he did end up becoming very good at, at his craft. And, well, and, and let, let me quantify your statement. The seed that was planted that made an incredible impact in the beginning of the mixed martial art world that Joe Camacho touched was planted by you whooping him. That's good. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Oh, I'll tell you another one. Here's another one. I might look like a real, a real asshole here, but this really happened. Um, we're watching uh, <laughs> we're watching some TV in the living room, of course, and, and, and Joe was there, and my brother-in-law, Pete, was there, and... Uh, uh, of course, we start get mixing it up, you know, after a few drinks, we start mixing it up. And uh, wait, wait, wait. Wait. this living room title is very important. You know, it's <laughs> you know, well, probably the most prestigious belt in everybody's household. Oh, man, we ended up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Joe didn't drink. He didn't drink at all. That's the crazy part about it. And we ended up getting into it in the living room and I end up choking him. And I'm choking him. And. Apparently, this is what my wife says, because my wife starts to slap me in the back of the head, try to get me off of him. I didn't know, but I'm just going for a choke. Well, apparently he was turning purple. That's what she says. And again, these are the things that we used to get into. And I wouldn't see him for a few few months and he'd come back and test me again. So that's that's how uh, he should. My wife was so mad at me at the time. It was so but, you know, that's where dudes, being dudes, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if Joe were around, he'd be telling that same story from his point of view with a smile. That's yeah, it. I think so. That's See, well, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> but wow. that's, how, that's how it went. And, uh, and uh, yeah, he taught me a lot. He, he was um, never afraid. That's one thing that I could tell you about him. He was never afraid to throw down anytime, anywhere, on the street. In a gym and he he was a good looking dude he was a he was a good looking dude he would constantly you know uh getting in trouble with girls and so forth and he, he was he was uh he was he was fun gotta admit he was fun it, oh, yeah. he, went, he, went to, he went to high school with mike beltran yeah mm -hmm. and that's how that's how this whole it's Mike Beltran, Joe, my wife, and me. That's how we all have this relationship. You know, we're kind of like family. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. At this time, you also got some reps in with Dean Lister. Dean Lister? Did I? I got to – there's so many things. There's so many times, seriously, that I get, like, told that I did this to a certain person <clears throat> in a practice, and I don't remember, man. I don't remember. Okay. I, I, I had run-ins with a lot of people in, in, in rooms, so. That's good. Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what it's all about. So yeah. you had mentioned uh, having it being difficult for you to lose. But let's kind of quantify that statement. A wrestling loss and an MMA loss, was one the same or was there a different weight on the scale for each of those? I think wrestling was a little little harder for me to take because of the amount of time that I put into it, you know, growing up and getting into it. It's to me, it was, I think so. Uh, I, I always approach fights as fights. Um, it could go either way. Uh, but yeah, uh, it also depends too, I think, on how hurt you are. You know, if you broke your hand and you lost, you know, if, you know, I've had tons of injuries. That's one of the major reasons why I think I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get, uh, once I started getting a groove, let's just say getting a groove in fighting, right? And, and the way you get better at fighting is fighting. And I couldn't get a groove going because every time I started one, I'd hurt myself. Something would break torn retina, broken orbital. Uh, I, I, before I even got in, um, uh, I fought, I, before I fought Uriah, I had just taken a couple years off because 
I did both my knees, reconstructed on both my knees. So stuff like that, I'd had to take months and years off every time. So it didn't become a good business for me to be in. You know what I mean? It, I would make some money and then I'd be hurt for the next seven, eight months to year and then try to come back. And it just wasn't good business and yeah. it didn't make sense. All right. Around this time, you also started with uh, New Breed. Mm -hmm. What was your experience like at that gym? I think it was, at the time, I think it was probably the best thing for me. And I think uh, Johnny Ramirez was probably the best jiu-jitsu coach around. I mean, he, the way he instructed, the way he explained things was in terms that I understood. So he's the one that took my jujitsu on a whole different level, you know, made me understand it, uh, appreciate it. Uh, the thing with, uh, with new breed was, and I love new breed. I mean, the, the, that was my home, but it got to a point where I realized that um, I wasn't doing jujitsu tournaments. I was fighting and I, I needed to find a, a fight school, not a jujitsu gym. You know what I mean? And that's why I had to make a career decision on, on, on leaving. I never left. It was never on bad terms. He understood, you know, we, we, we were really close. We talked about it and I need, yeah, you left, I you need left with the door open. You left with yeah. the door open, not closed. Yeah. Right. I, I just, uh, I needed, I needed to go get punched in the face. You know, it's, I needed to, to get kicked. I needed people to push me in that in mixed martial arts, not just in jujitsu because in jujitsu, they were, I mean, we would have guys, Andre Galvao coming in. We had Vito Belfort. We had uh, Walid Ishmael. We had Carlson Gracie when he was live. We had, uh, God, uh, we had tons who's who? of these guys. Who's who? It was yeah. crazy. The who's who that was there. I mean, seriously, they would, stay, they would stay there in the gym, sleep on the mats, and we'll train all day in jiu-jitsu. But again, that was jiu-jitsu, which was great. But I, I, I needed to, to, to fight. Yeah. What, what about John Owano? How was your relationship with him? Oh, fabulous. That guy's an awesome dude. He taught me so much, too. I mean, that's another guy that I think gets left out of uh, yep. the mixed martial arts, the, the or, origins. If you guys have, you guys talked to him. He's one guy that would be great interview, too. He uh, developed the first pride gloves, the first... UFC gloves, I mean, gloves were key to the cage. He really marketed his gloves really well. And it was funny. His geese. His geese are phenomenal. Yeah, his geese. I mean, he really innovator, you know. Um, he would always give us uh, gloves, different types of gloves to test in practice. So I'd get, he would make, <laughs> he would, he would make gel gloves, like gel gloves. And you put them on, yeah. they were heavy. They were heavy. You would never really train with those suckers because you'd get KO'd real, real, real easy, but they were full of gel, like heavy, something that he would put in there. And uh, we had those, we had pride gloves, UFC gloves, King of the Cage gloves, Gladiator Challenge gloves. We had all these different types of gloves that, and he would just make them and have us test them. What about uh, even King Shero? Oh um, man. Kind of a controversial figure. That's a that's a that's a tough one, man. Um, he is a good friend of mine. Stayed at my house. I cornered him many times in his fights. I think it's just what he is accused of doing, or I don't know if he ever, he didn't get convicted because he didn't get a chance to go. But what he has been accused of doing, there's no way coming back from that, though. You know, there's no. I mean, there. I hate to say it, he's a piece of shit if that, you know, and um, uh, it's just terrible. I, I, when I found out, I was really, really upset about it, you know, and, and I'm well, sure. It hurt. Yeah. I mean, he was, a, he, I mean, just let me quantify this. He was an, a very important part of the mixed martial art community, literally fought a who's who. Mm -hmm. Joey, you've got some experiences with him too, correct? He was he was pretty famous <clears throat> in uh, Kauai. Uh, it was very well known if you ever vacationed on that island. And I went to Vegas with him for UFC. We were tight. I, and I, 
the guy that I knew couldn't have done the thing that he did. So it, how much did the concussions change him? So I just try to remember him as the guy from 2001 and not the guy at the end because that it, it just, it's very sad. That's a good way of looking at it, man. Cause I, to be honest with you, I, I didn't look at it that way um, mm. with concussions and so forth. Uh, I, I don't know if that even played a factor. I'm, you know, maybe I'm hoping that you're right, but yeah. I just don't think, you know, it hurts. It's, it's, it, it hurts. Yeah. There, oh, I, yeah. I can't really, really even say anything about it because I, again, like, like Joey says, I knew him a certain way and the guy that I knew, he wasn't capable of doing that. At least I thought he wasn't. So I don't know. That's a tough one, man. It, 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 dude, it's a, it's a hard, it's real easy to make a blanket statement. Like mm -hmm. you just said, piece of shit. And you know what? You're correct. I, I've got a guy, I don't want to mention any names, 20 year yeah. relationship. Um, I mean, the guy has done more for me than anybody else in a mixed martial art world. And he got caught. He didn't, he got caught looking at pictures. And it's like, you know what, man? I just I can't have you in my life anymore. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, I think it's drugs or alcohol or some sort of addiction that's rotted his brain. But at the end of the day, I can't have you in my life. I apologize. Thank you for what you've done. But you're going your way. I'm going my way. I can't, I, I can't have that touch me. And yeah. um, it's a shame, man. It really is a shame. And, and, and the mind is a very, it's a very tricky thing. It really is. You just, you don't know what's happening to go down that path you just hope that it wasn't always there yeah, right. and, 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 and the way joey joey said about concussions he did, i never thought about that and he's in a lot he, it, he for know? sure had cte yes and, yes and, uh, he got caught with, with he, he admitted in a in a in a suicide note after he was arrested See, that, that i didn't i didn't know about that but the he evan did. that yeah. i the evan that i knew um did exactly what I thought he would do, knowing that he, he wouldn't be able to live with himself. No, no. you know, I, 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 Travis Fulton is a name that comes up in this conversation as well. He definitely had a criminal element to him, not a very good person. The, his fight record is, is bonkers. Sometimes he intermingled, but at the end of the day, say what you want about Travis Fulton, he did the right thing in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, he did the right thing in the end. You know, yeah. people know your secret. You take yourself out. There is some honor in that, whether yeah. you agree with yeah. it or not. There's some honor in that. I, I knew he wouldn't be able to live with himself. So when that happened, yeah. when that happened, I kind of like was like, yeah, yeah, it's Evan yeah. right there. You know. Yeah, he was also clean and sober in his young days too. Like he didn't even mm -hmm. drink. So he the fact it. that he went off the rails on drugs. I think that also speaks to CTE. I mean, you know more than I do then because yeah. I, I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. Know yeah. That. I was in Vegas with him and he was, he just, he never even drank, but as he got older and as he got knocked out more times, he got more impulsive. And uh, so it went down a couple that's, of very dark roads. It's yeah, a very, that's, it's, it's a, it's a telltale sign as well of CTE or, or brain trauma. Yeah. Wow. It's impulsivity. Oops. Yeah. It, it makes me that that kind of brings a little it makes it a little easier for me to be honest you right know, to kind of you know, put I, that in perspective. I, I always kind of look at relationships i know this is way off topic of you meet somebody let's just say you pass on and you meet the afterlife hey man we crossed paths it was really good i say we do it again when we go back and it, it like with people like that because they've done so much with you and there was so much good mm -hmm. it's hard to say no yes but you have to, like, you have to say, Hey dude, it's just, it's just one of those lines. You just, yeah. yeah. You don't cross. You can't, you can't, yeah. dude, you can't cross yeah. it. And, 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 you know, based on how you handled the relationship after that speaks volumes of you. And what I trust you with my kids, what well, depends on how you handle that relationship. Yeah, no, there's no, there, I had my kids. Like I said, he stayed in my house where my kids were at. Ooh. So I, I mean, I, I I feel guilty, you know. Sometimes I, I, in the past, I felt guilty. Not now as much, but you know, for having him there. But I didn't know, you know. If again, if all this stuff, if that CT something that just makes me feel 
a whole lot better about the situation. Yeah, yeah let, let's move on. I mean, it's, it's it's a heavy subject, but you know what, man? Yeah. We're not dodging anything here. You know, there's, there's no... Yeah, let's do it. You know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. After Bobby Gamboa and your, your rematch, um, it was a unique way how that fight came together. Did oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my buddy Dave Rivas was supposed to fight uh, Bobby. And again, I had already had um, my two knee surgeries uh, scheduled. So I have not been, I hadn't been training at all. Um, and again, I was really light still. It didn't matter. On the way to Wayne's, my buddy David was having issues with uh, the weight cut. And um, he was hurting real bad on the way up. I, you know, on the way up, we grabbed in and out burgers and I ate, we all ate going up. But my buddy David was in the back sleeping, trying to, he was going to make weight. So he, we ended up getting there and Joe's with us also. And Dave is like maybe a pound, maybe, maybe even less than that off at 145s. And um, he's get, he barely could get on the scale. And I, I don't know, Bobby was on this tirade. He was all pissed off. And, and uh, David was, I'm on, I'm on. He's looking down at the scale. He goes, I'm on. And uh, they're saying, no, you're not. You know, you're not. He goes, no, I'm, I'm on. And David is like totally, is, he's really in bad shape. So then Joe comes up to me and go, it go, goes, hey, man, if he can't make weight, why don't you fight him? Dude, this is Joe. That's his mentality, right? And I'm like, hell no. Hell no. You know, I'm not going to fight this guy. I just ate a double cheeseburger. I don't want to freaking fight. And he go, and, and then uh, Bobby comes down, pissed off, kicks the fucking the, the the scale that Dave was trying to weigh in on, and brings his own scale and puts it on the floor. He goes, "You don't make weight on that scale. You make weight on this fucking scale." He tells him, and Bobby's just pissed. I mean, he he's really pissed off. So now I'm starting to get pissed, right? I'm starting to get pissed now. I'm like, "Who the fuck is this guy?" You know what I mean? And and, and then uh, and then Joe's in my ear going. Dude, just can step on the scale, see if you make weight, and then fight him tomorrow. You know, fight him tomorrow. And I was, I was like, he's starting to, he's starting to get to me now. Joe's starting to get to me. I'm like, oh. so, but, but, but why does Gamboa turn his focus to you? Because Joe starts to initiate this shit. Oh, right? It's a, <laughs> he's a shit starter. So, he's a shit starter. So he's telling me, he's like, hey Charlie, why don't you fight him? Like, you know, and then Bobby, who is relishing for a damn rematch because of the way it ended. And he knew, I, I mean, I wasn't going to fight for a while because I had already, I was already scheduled for surgery. So he comes in, he goes, well, if you make, if you make weight, I'll fight you. He tells me. So I'm thinking I'm not going to make weight. I had just eaten a double cheeseburger. Right. So I get on the scale and I'm like, oh shit, you know. And, and the funny thing about it was that my my wife bought me these little underwear, and uh, I was wearing them for I don't know why the fuck I was wearing them that night. Are we and, talking uh, like with the elephant trunk in front? What kind no, of just some little to? like speedo looking, nothing crazy, but just some speedo ones that I've never ever wear, you know. Showing off your goods. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> so, so then I go, I get on the scale, and I look down. I'm like, damn, I'm close. It's like, shit, all right. So I take my shirt off. Ah, see, I'm getting closer. So I think, Joe's like, take your pants off. Take your, take your pants off. Take everything off. You'll make weight. Fuck. I'm like, no, I'm mean, going to take my pants off knowing I got these underwear here, right? But I take them off and, and I get on and I make weight. So then I'm like, oh, shit. I haven't trained. I make weight. Now I got to call the wife and tell her I'm fighting tomorrow. The next day, the next day, I have a job interview at six o'clock down at Cedar Sinai back the, in the hospital, and so I have to go drive home. And if you know the Wayans at King of the Cage were like 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, so I'm I have to drive back home. By the time I get home, it was about one o'clock in the morning. I call my wife. I tell her I'm gonna. Well, before I call her up, tell her I'm fighting. She's like, no, you're not. I'm like, yeah, David didn't make weight. And then Joe freaking 
instigated this shit. So, so it's her fault. So yeah, it's his and she fault. introduced you to Joe. This is her yeah. fault. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I end up uh, uh, going to the job interview, doing the job interview from downtown LA, driving all the way back. And again, I'm 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 calm. I'm cool. I don't care. I go to the movie theater, right? And and uh, and Bobby's pissed off because I'm not doing any of the the media stuff that I'm supposed to do, and they're blowing up my phone. And I'm at the movie theater with my wife. I've already made weight. I've already you know I didn't I didn't care. I just wanted to relax. So I get back and and. Bobby's pissed because I'm not there. Like he didn't think I was going to show up. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm here, man. You know, no big deal. But again, I had, when I fought Bobby that one, I really had no training whatsoever, no training whatsoever. And I tried to prove a point again. He, he, he basically was telling me that whole time before he goes, I know what he's going to do. He's going to take me down and he's just going to stay on top of me. He goes, he's not going to want to stand up with me. He says, and, I'm, and and so what I did was I stood up with him. That was my stubbornness, you know. So you obviously win that fight by decision, but you also mm -hmm. retire at this time. What what took place that made that happen? Well, I got my two knees done right after that, and then in wow. training, and then uh, in training, uh, I broke my orbital bone. How does that happen? Okay, you, you know how you're uh, you're in guard and you try to underhook the leg and go for an arm bar. Yeah. Well, his knee his knee came right in my eye socket. Yeah. Was that and Dave Revis's knee? That was, that was Dave Revis's knee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, his, a, and, and, and then you know what he says? He says, a, "What this Dave was? If, if Dave would have stuck to it, and he he would have been such a good fighter, but he's he was such a dick too." He says, "Well, you can't make a." scrambled days without breaking an egg he told me something like that i don't know it's some something he told me that right after and little did i know how badly damaged i was and he still lay i had a garage underneath us and i'd matted it out put a punching bag and would always go in there afterwards and just train and that's where it happened so i didn't know how badly injured i was uh i i went i went upstairs and I, I try to take a shower and I was throwing up in the shower, which I can't Oh, that's concussion. Was, that's concussion, was, boy. I was concussed and I barely could take a shower. And um, the, my wife was at work and then Joe's girlfriend at the time called my wife at work and she came home. Or I'm sorry, yeah, just take them there. I went to, I went to um, the Kaiser on Sunset in downtown LA. And they thought I had got assaulted and they were, they thought I was like, because I was pretty messed up and she literally carried me in, you know? And um, little did I know that uh, one of my muscles in my eye got lodged on some of the, somewhere messed up in there like a nerve and my eye did not move for like three months. Oh. Yeah, it was uh, pretty bad. I had surgery, I had a screw. I had a, a broken cheekbone, uh, nasal nasal fracture, which they had to put a screw in there, and um, had well, surgery. I couldn't move my eye for a very long time. But crazy part about that was that my son had a high fever like months prior to that, and his eye stopped moving. And I basically followed the procedure on what they did with him for me, and it worked, and, and, and I got a patch and basically covered my good eye and forced my bad eye to start moving again. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah Rebus, uh, kind of a, uh, one of those guys that, uh, I think he's underappreciated. Mm -hmm. And like you said, if he would have stuck with it, let's, let's go through, you know, we're at about the 90 minute mark. We're going to go through some of the, uh, the people in your life. Let's, let's start with, uh, Randy Velarde. Oh yeah, he was cool, man. Love that guy. Loved watching him fight. He could have been special, you know. It's another. Robert so Emerson. Many, yeah, 
he could have been special. I mean, unfortunately, what happened to him? Um, crazy, right? I mean, you know what happened to him when he got in that fight at the nightclub and had to get, I think, uh, airlifted out of there. And he was he got, stabbed, right? Was he stabbed? He got stabbed, yeah. See, that, and that's the thing. It's, I mean, there's so many times you could get away with it, right? So find somebody who just does something like that. And he, he fought the guy, kicked the guy's ass a few, uh, many times, but little did he know the guy was stabbing him little multiple stabs all over his back and his front because he was on top of him. But he didn't feel it. Then he goes back into the bar, sits at the bar, starts getting a little oozy. And realizes he's just bleeding out. And then wow. That, that, yeah. What about your former roommate, Manny Tapia? Amazing man. My brother. Um, that man is uh, a great human being. Definitely. Uh, a monster in the training room. Uh, him and I would... It, it would always escalate. We would always go, okay, we're going to go, let's go 50%. And then 50% went to 60, 70. And by the time the end, you know, we're already going to hundred percent swinging at each other. You know, uh, we ended up. You're, you're, you're with, describing a friendship. That's what that yeah, is. It's, <laughs> oh man. We would go in there and one time uh, we clashed heads and cut each other. We both got, I got cut over the eye. He got cut over the eye, but that's because we were, we were just stubborn. We, we, we just wanted to go at it and it escalated and we start swinging hard and we, we end up in the same emergency room. <laughs> when, uh, I, I've actually got a list of like, what if fighters, like guys that maybe if they would have stuck with it, they could have done great things. Betis Mansouri is on that list. Yeah, Jeez. but he's another good dude. He's hilarious. Uh, yeah, good jujitsu. You know, uh, I think, went over I think Adrian what, Serrano. Yeah, you know, I think what happened with him was uh, back. He had a bad back and still had surgery on his back, and I think that kind of pushed him to being more of a coach than than actually uh, fighting. Marcel Lozado. Oh, that guy. That dude uh, was a tough, tough Brazilian, man. I mean, he built like a house. I mean, hips, uh, probably, if not probably the best jiu-jitsu guy that I rolled with that, that really blended wrestling with it, you know, and, and judo. He really was good at throwing, good at stopping takedowns, and a monster on top. That's me. Another guy that um, I don't think gets the credit that he deserved, Saad Awad. Oh, yeah. He's a gamer, too, man. That guy, he's a, 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 he's a fighter, for sure a fighter, and probably one of the coolest individuals you'll ever meet. Just a good dude. Just a good guy, man. I, I love it. Let me close this window here real quick. Sure. Take your time. I got the gardener selling probably out there. But yeah, Saad, Saad's a good dude. I'm glad that uh, he, he, he kept fighting. He's one guy that's a uh, big guy, big guy, tougher, tougher shit, and worked his ass off in the gym. Did you, do you remember Ray uh, Lizama? I did, yes. Yeah, good left hook. Really good left hook. Uh, again, just tough dudes man i mean these guys are really really tough guys man the millennia came out with a lot of good fighters back Dude. In the game, you know I mean, and, and just so people know oh you know who is he well mm -hmm. he's got to win over over saint crew and he beat fabio nagao he's got a 500 record because he either he had a really brave manager or he managed himself and couldn't say no to a fight that, that's that's who he yeah. is well back in those days man i mean there was no really like when we used to train we trained like we were going to fight. My model was always, you know, if I'm going to run a marathon, I train running, right? I, I, I'm running. If I'm going to train for a fight, I got to fight. So we'd take our little gloves, not that much padding, and we'd go rounds just like if we were fighting, and which was not good, of course, because you end up getting hurt a lot. But 
that was the mentality back then. So we would be, we would be black eyes, cuts, whatever it may be, but that was part of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David Step. David Step. I didn't get a chance to really work out with that guy too much. That was a little way still before me. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Unless, again, I somehow, you know, got in there with them. I don't remember. Did you get a chance to work out with uh, Tony D'Souza? Yeah. Well, D- Tony was my uh, high school uh, uh, wrestling nemesis, let's just say. He was really? He, yeah. He, he ended up, um, he won the state championship my year. We graduated in my weight class. Uh, the guy he, the guy he beat in the finals, I I uh, lost to him at Masters, and uh, he we, we trained. Me and DeSosa trained as wrestling partners for CIF and Masters, and then we ended up training again at Millennia uh, for MMA. But he's a big dude. I'm telling you, I stayed small, and he everybody else grew grew up. Yeah, you've had a uh, phenomenal career. We're at the 90-minute mark. We usually try to kind of wrap things up. Otherwise, too, okay, I've, sorry I've got that. like, I, I, you know what I mean? Like, I'll, your wife is going to yell at me through your Zoom, and I don't think that would it'd be a good clip, but I don't think it would be healthy for your household. Oh, no. <laughs> you, you, you don't want Chris mad at you. It's terrifying. <laughs> no, <right. laughs> Trust no, me. She loves this. She loves this. She, she was a part of it the whole way, so... I said, sometimes I have to fact check myself with her because she remembers. Let's expand on that. You met your wife earlier before your MMA career. Even I met her in seventh grade. Let's talk about the ups and downs in a relationship and how somebody like her stuck with you the entire time, always giving you the foundation needed. Well, I mean, I wish, I wish it was always like that, but I mean, of course, having a full-time job, competing, uh, going away. Later in my career, I would leave for months to go train. I mean, it's difficult. It'll be difficult on anybody. Um, We've, you know, we've separated. We've gotten back together. We've uh, fought. At the end of the day, the the one thing I could say is that everything that made it so difficult, in our relationship is what's making it so much easier and nicer now, if that makes sense. Um, I think going through all that uh, made me appreciate it, you know, and and I think uh, sometimes relationships need some rough waters, some, you know, and and I think that's what makes us stronger. You got to experience the rain to enjoy the sunshine. Absolutely. And that's what makes us stronger today. So there's nothing we can't handle. You know what I mean? And, and you know, and the, the fighter lifestyle is something that men become addicted to, but it's at the peril of, of, of relationships mm-hmm. and significant others that, that mean a lot to them. And for your wife to, to be here today, I mean, it's, it's a genuine relationship. That's, yeah, that's I, all. Thank you. Does. You know, but it's, it's fine. Fighters are fighters for a reason. You know what I mean? We're kind of a little sick in the head. So we need a little bit of a, we need a little fight in our personal relationships, I think. You know, I mean, again, looking back at it, you go, ah, it's kind of crappy. It was no good. But I don't think I could have been with anybody else if she didn't have a little fight in, in her herself. If you don't you get know? any pushback, you're right? looking for the next fight. And there's yeah. no fun in it. There's no fun in it. Yeah, there's no fun yeah. in it. So I, I I make it a point to get in trouble every month or something. You know, just a test her, <laughs> just a test her. Not for you, for her. It's for her, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, Charlie, I got to say, you being the first 145 pound, you know, title holder here in the Americas, uh, you know, the only, really the only other competition you could have had, especially at, at the really lower weight classes at the time was in Japan, of which was incredibly to, to thread together. Truly an honor to, to have you on the podcast. And, and in my opinion, first ballot hall of famer, you're in the pioneer way. Thank you very much. And thanks. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Joey, Thank you, Charlie. You want to close out, dude? 
Yeah, we appreciate having you on. Uh, I just really wanted to make sure that Charlie's chapter in this book, you know, got put on the podcast. Uh, I've kind of made it my business since I'm on the West Coast to make sure that the people that I spend a lot of time with uh, get a chance to tell their story and I like to help them tell it. So, Charlie, thank you very much for being here. Yeah. So, thank you. Jo- yeah, Joey, he's got Savan Young. He got us Larry Landless. I know he's working at Hurt Dean. Got yourself. I mean, these you guys are the brick and mortar of the mixed martial art world. I just had Mike Rogers on from St. Louis. It's guys like you that built, you know, the foundation for the house that it's on. And Charlie, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the blood and sweat of guys like you, man. And we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Take care, brother. You too. Well, that concludes our Charlie Valencia interview. Joey Venti, you were instrumental in landing him as a guest. I uh, I hope it checked all the boxes, as they say. Yeah, covered a lot of good things. We got the first half of his career in, and uh, you know he's he's a great guy. And he was a good interview. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, like you've given us Savant Young, Larry Landless, Charlie Valencia. I think we got Mike Guymond lined up. We haven't recorded up and up until this time, but we got a, a pretty solid confirmation on him. Um, you're really kind of knocking out the uh, millennia guys as well as. Uh, that little area of California that, uh, you know, you, you, you belong to. I'm pulling some strings to try to get John Marsh. I think he would be a phenomenal energy. Hey, John Marsh would be really good. He's one of those guys with a reputation, a lot like Joe Riggs, where as good mm-hmm. as he was in the cage, in the training room, it, nobody wanted to mess with him. You know, he's, he's got a reputation of, uh, you know, everybody had a lot of respect for him. And he's got some very crazy stories in Japan and uh, and in Russia. It would be awesome to get him to share some of them. Right. He's kind of a hangover from that NHB era with headbutts. And Absolutely. He traveled internationally during that period. So, like, he literally dealt with different mafia factions from different countries. He, 100% he did. And I think he started, like, in the neutral grounds days. So that was back in the NHB. And uh, yeah, he had a hell of a career and he's got even better stories. Yeah, that, that'd be a good one. So ladies and gentlemen, just we're doing like, share, subscribe right now. I, I need a little bit of help um, on iTunes or anywhere you can leave a review. If you guys leave us five stars, no matter what you write, I'm going to read it here. Um, we had three more recent reviews. Uh, hands down, one of the best podcasts. That's from KJV uh, Bible Reader. Best MMA podcast, great hosts and guests, great questions. This is for true MMA fans. That's from Subhunter84. And then DM11, great show, y'all keeping history alive and and some great stories out of your guests through the good and sometimes tough questions. And you're also very thorough research, the Sherlock Holmes of combat sports. Appreciate that. Those are real important. Like you guys, if we can get to like 200 of those, we're a little bit under 50 right now. With 80,000 downloads only from iTunes, I have to assume there's a few people that have the ability to leave a review and write whatever you want. We don't care. Just five stars. Um, Have you been to MixedMartialArts.com in the underground forum yet, Joey? Just logged on yesterday, yeah. Just signed up for it. It's an interesting little message board. It's a lot of grumpy, angry MMA fans with a boatload of knowledge that's actually sometimes shocking um i oftentimes will kind of glean some of my little you know background tips from that page itself it's i highly recommend it um john morgan is the moderator there seems to be a tidal wave of people wanting to put that position in hong kong fooey's hands he's always been good to us in our podcast um i kind of stand by that as well john morgan Really good at asking questions to Dana White being first in line. Not such a good moderator uh, in a lot of people's opinions. I got to go with my guy, Hong Kong Fooey. But there's also Reddit. Have you been to Reddit? Also yesterday. You told me to sign up for both of those. So I'm brand new on both. Dude, Reddit. Reddit's like a war zone. Like there's 50 different rules to even post a subject. And all they do is figure out how to disqualify your subject. So there's only like three people posting tons of topics and then you're allowed to comment on it, 
But if you ever want to contribute going, hey, what about this? This is interesting. Dude, I, it's, it's not a place where, where I'm really good at. And it's a place that I know is important. There's a guy, Six Demon Bag, that posts our stuff somehow, gets it through the goalie. And whenever he does that, we see huge amounts of traffic coming from there over to our site. So if you guys are over on Reddit, I, I can't do it, but I, it, it certainly helps. That, that is also really good. So, Joey, Charlie Valencia, first 145-pound champion. If there was a brick-and-mortar Hall of Fame, in my opinion, he would belong in it. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. In 2004, I was in Japan for the final uh, conflict uh, pride event, and I was wearing my Submission Factory shirts, and a couple of times, guys would stop me and ask me about Charlie. Like, Charlie was on the radar of the Japanese MMA fans because – he was the champion from America. So, you know, he was kind of a big deal in like, you know, niche communities. That's pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. And the Japanese mixed martial arts scene back then was so educated. Like, absolutely. Yeah. One of the coolest yeah. things. They had Shudo, which had a lot of the lighter weight guys. So, you know, they always kept their eyes open for who the little guys were in America. And, you know, they know who he was. And that was a big deal back then. Miguel Torres was offered Kid Yamamoto in order to define the best 100 or 135 pound fighter in the world. And essentially they said, all right, we're going to give you $1,500. You're not allowed to bring a corner and we bring you in two days before you leave the day after. And Torres at the time, like I, he was based out of Hammond, Indiana, which is like 15 minutes outside of Chicago. And because he sold so many tickets and so many people were like fans of his, you know, walking in with mariachi bands and stuff like that, he would make $20,000 a fight. I believe and, it. And he'd be like, well, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give Kid Yamamoto 10 grand and a corner. He can fight here for me, you know, against me here, and I'll give him all the time he needs. Yeah. And um, Shudo turned it down. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, Yamamoto, strong wrestler, kind of Torres is, you know, not, not his biggest strength wrestling. Like, in a five-round fight, man, dude, I really would have. I It's like one of those fights that we got cheated out of. Absolutely, yeah. In his prime, Miguel was, he was on fire. Yeah, and, like, the California guys would be kind of like, you guys used to always kind of, like, stick your nose up at us. And we would always be angry because you guys got, like, more opportunity but your caliber of athlete was very high in California. Well, I was a Carlson Gracie lineage, so we definitely knew Miguel, and we had a lot of respect for him because Gracie had a lot of respect for him. It was always that he, he was going to be this next big star. So he was on our radar. I don't, I don't know anybody that had their nose up when it came to him. No, at least, no, no. At least not in no. our gym. So you guys wouldn't refer to us as a fly. Oh, from the flyover state. Flyover state. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, this is about Charlie Valencia. And Charlie at the time, I think one of the surprising things is he was weighing, he could have fought at 125. In college, he wrestled at 118. And uh, most of his matches were at 145. When he got the WEC, I think he started fighting at 135. But, but yeah, he was a guy that could have made 125. He, he, he weighed in last minute for a last minute title fight in the King of the Cage after going to in and out I think he was talking about. He still made weight. Like he was completely out of his weight division and still did some great things. That's wild. That's wild. But you know, it's guys like that that one they're underappreciated. Um and like their their place in history is actually very significant. It's unfortunate that you know, he's not a household name, but that's why we exist. You know, people like that not get the credit they, that they deserve, you know, connected you and I. Yeah, no, that's what we do here. We get them, uh, give them the chance to put their chapter in the big book of MMA history. Excellent. Well, Joey, anytime you want to sit in, dude, we got an open door policy with that of yourself. We sincerely appreciate it. I'm not going to throw Herb Dean's name around, but I look at your social media and I know you guys are pretty close as well. He uh, might be a good guest. That's all I'm saying. It's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm planting the seeds. <laughs> I'm, I'm angling. I'm angling. I would love to get him on, and uh, I think at one point we might be able to pull that off. I, I think what we might have to do is play the Savant card, Savant Young, 
Like we, if we got them both on together, I think that that'd be an easy sell because I think they'd have a great time doing it. Yeah. I just saw Savant this morning and um, yeah, he's not, he's not against doing a, a part two himself, but he would love to do it with her. I think that'd be good and healthy. I mean, you got two guys that really, you know, they were knee deep in the muck of beginning MMA. And I think that could be some real good exchanges as well. But either way, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Please like, share, subscribe. Any way that you guys can help us out, it's greatly appreciated. I've got a couple of T-shirts. If you guys want them for absolutely no cost, I'm going to need some timestamps on some of our interviews. Shoot me a message in your side. I need timestamps. I'll send you a couple of T-shirts. So, Joey, thank you so much, dude. I appreciate it. Glad to be a part of it. Be good. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.